Zeitgeist the Movie was a 2007 documentary film made by a guy named Peter Joseph. It was made in three parts. Part one was expressing something called the Christ myth theory, or sometimes called the copycat thesis, which is what we're going to be talking about today. The other two parts were about the September 11th attacks and the Federal Reserve System. There were some sequels to this movie, like Zeitgeist Addendum, which focuses further on the monetary system and advocates a resource-based social system, and it's influenced by the ideas of a guy named Jacques Fresco and the Venus Project. Following Zeitgeist Addendum, Peter Joseph created an organization called the Zeitgeist Movement to promote the ideas of Fresco's Venus Project. A newer one has come out recently called Zeitgeist Moving Forward, and it basically has the same ideas and goals as Zeitgeist Addendum. Part one of the movie is really just popularizing a concept that's sometimes called the copycat thesis, which is an offshoot of the Jesus myth or Christ myth theory. The core idea is that Jesus was a copycat of previous gods in ancient history, gods like Horus, Krishna, Mithra, and they tell us here, for example, that Horus was born of a virgin, that he was crucified, and that he rose again after three days. There is usually the idea that the Bible was written as a kind of allegory of astrological occurrences. That is, that the accounts of Jesus' life were really just about the sun's or certain constellations' movement in the sky. This is sometimes referred to as astrotheology. And in addition, it's often claimed that Jesus did not exist as a historical person in this theory. The film Zeitgeist has been seen over 100 million times around the world, according to their website. And this particular view was more or less also popularized by the film The God Who Wasn't There in 2005. So this is something that you're going to deal with if you haven't already. And it's good to be armed with some of the information that I'll be presenting today. I've offered a cash reward to anyone who can prove the claims that Zeitgeist makes with my website zeitgeistchallenge.com. The website has been up since shortly after the film's release in 2007, and I have yet to receive a single serious submission to the Zeitgeist Challenge. The history of all this really goes no further than the 18th century. The term Jesus or Christ myth theory, also known as the non-existence hypothesis, does not have an exact and agreed-upon meaning, but has been used to describe various related concepts, such as Jesus originally being an allegorical myth. In order to talk about the origin of the copycat thesis that Zeitgeist promotes, we need to first talk about the origins of this theory, and the idea that Jesus did not exist as a historical person. I find it humorous, and I hope you can see the humor in this too, that the first questions of whether or not Jesus existed came during the Enlightenment period of the 18th century. To say it another way, 1,700 years after Christ is when the first idea that Christ didn't exist as a historical person started. Now, isn't that exactly the opposite of how it should go? I mean, if it was true that he really didn't exist. Because the information that Jesus didn't exist would have been music to the ears of, say, the Jewish authorities in the A.D. era, who were losing converts left and right to Christianity. That would have been music to the ears of the Romans, too, who brutally killed Christians in the Colosseums for the next few hundred years, or to the pagan temple authorities who were losing money and converts all during biblical times as well as the time after the Bible. All this due to the spread of the story of the resurrected man named Jesus. Jesus, real or not, had plenty of enemies who would have salivated at the opportunity to simply point out to people that he wasn't real. Jesus, not being real, would have solved all of their problems. Yet, we don't hear this claim from these types of people. And, as we will see, almost all the non-biblical evidence for Jesus was given to us by the enemies of Christianity. And, in almost all of those cases, they did try to discredit him in their writings, but they did not question his existence. Instead, they, say, called his miracles parlor tricks. They said he was an illegitimate child. They said he wasn't God. But you can be sure that they would have much preferred to simply say that Jesus never existed. But they didn't have that luxury. The generations after Jesus remembered him too well to claim that he was some allegory. It would be like if I tried to convince everyone here that Abraham Lincoln didn't exist. Nobody would buy it. It's only been about 150 years or so since he died. 
there are probably still people who remember their great-grandparents' stories about him. Maybe they even met him. A story like that would have to wait another 1,600 years or so for all the evidence to totally disintegrate. Then I might be able to get some people to take it seriously. But too many people nowadays have been affected by the life of Abraham Lincoln. Imagine if Abraham Lincoln went around making crippled people walk and blind men see and raising men from the dead. So, the primary forerunners of the Jesus myth theory are identified as two French philosophers, Charles Francois Dupuis and Colmé de Volnay. These guys borrowed from each other's work, but they basically couldn't get their story straight. One said that Jesus was just an allegory, and the other said he did exist as a historical person, but with some minor changes. Napoleon, who knew Volney personally, was probably basing his opinion on Volney's work when he stated in October 1808 that the existence of Jesus was an open question. Later, critics argued that Volney and Dupuis had based their views on limited historical data. German theologian David Strauss caused a scandal in Europe with the publication of his Das Leben Jesu, published in English as The Life of Jesus Critically Examined in 1860, in which he argued that some of the stories about Jesus appeared to be mythical, concluding that early Christian communities had fabricated material based on Old Testament stories and concepts. Strauss did not argue that Jesus was entirely invented, but that historically there were only a small core of facts that could be asserted about him. The German historian Bruno Bauer took Strauss's arguments and carried them to their furthest point, arguing that Jesus had been entirely fabricated. He thereby became the leading proponent of the Jesus myth theory. A notorious hater of Jews, Bauer, quote, preferred a mythical Jesus based on the philosopher Seneca to one that had been a Jew. In the 20th century, several writers published arguments against Jesus' historicity, ranging from the scholarly to the fanciful. Proponents of the theory drew on the work of liberal theologians who tended to deny the value of to the sources for Jesus outside the New Testament. In other words, as more proof for the existence of Jesus kept coming in, they kept finding ways to deny it. And that is ultimately why this evidence always remains on the fringes, even today. It requires people to deny valid historical evidence, evidence that would easily be accepted if it was any other historical figure. And we're going to see in a moment that this theory is rejected by university-level historians of all types, atheist, agnostic, and theist. These historians at university levels are almost unanimous in their rejecting of this theory. So some of these authors are J.M. Robertson, William Benjamin Smith, Arthur Drews. Arthur Drews is interesting. He wrote The Christ Myth, which was first published in 1909. He took the route of a total denial of Jesus' existence. Drew's work was highly regarded by Lenin. Several editions of Drew's The Christ Myth were published in the Soviet Union from the early 1920s onwards, and his arguments were included in school and university textbooks. Public meetings asking Did Christ Live were organized, during which party operatives debated with clergymen. And I've seen recently in a forum where one of the proponents of this theory was asked if they had any evidence of any university level scholars agreeing with this view and what they did was actually show the university textbooks of the Soviet Union during Lenin's reign as proof that some university scholars did in fact believe this view. The next is a guy named Paul Louis Couchard, I don't know, it's a French name. He was a French doctor who turned poet who wrote a series of essays and books. He taught that Jesus was essentially just a representation of the highest aspirations of the human soul. And I just find it interesting how all these guys pretty much come up with a totally different story. You know, it, it's amazing because if this was true, I mean, how come no two people are coming up with the same conclusions about why it's not true? A different phase of this theory entered with the construct of the dying and rising God. This was popularized by the Scottish anthropologist Sir James Fraser in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm going to quote here from J.P. Holding from Tectonics.org. He says, Fraser believed that the religions of the ancient Near East provided several examples of dying and rising gods who had emerged from primitive belief systems, most notably Addis, Adonis, and Osiris. 
Fraser's theory is loaded with problems. Whole papers, even books criticizing his theory have been written. And nowadays, it is extremely difficult to find any recognized, reputable anthropologist who will accept it, even in a modified form. Here are some major problems and difficulties with it. Number one, Fraser's sources were frequently inaccurate or irrelevant. Fraser himself subscribed to the discredited 19th century ideas such as the evolutionist model of human societal development, which has nothing to do with the theory of biological evolution and is today firmly rejected by experts, and the notion that present-day primitive tribesmen can be studied as a means of finding out what things were like at the dawn of civilization. Evidence which has emerged since Fraser wrote has not only failed to back up his hypotheses, it has fatally undermined them. But really, these theories really start to crumble as more information becomes available. Even very recently, the ability to look up what ancient cultures said about their gods was very limited to perhaps people that could read those ancient languages and things like that. Nowadays, with the internet, almost all of that stuff is translated into English or other languages, so we can actually essentially check the facts of these bold claims. Fraser's writings and this lack of information to discredit them at the time influenced famous author C.S. Lewis. He tried to deal with what must have seemed to him to be a very big blow to Christianity when he wrote his paper called Myth Becomes Reality, which essentially conceded some of the points made by Fraser. He argued that although there might have been myths about dying and rising gods, it has now happened in reality. He did a really good job of coming up with an argument in favor of Christianity, even if what Fraser said was true. Lewis was doing all he could based on the limited information that he and others had. How could Lewis check Fraser's facts? Today, it would be easy for us. We have the internet, we can simply Google it, and it's there right in front of us. All the text ever written about any certain myth, we can simply go find out if Addis was ever said to be resurrected. We could prove him wrong almost instantly. We're almost done with our history lesson here, but as it relates to Zeitgeist, we need to talk about a few more individuals, because it's really their version of history that's believed by millions of people today. They are Kersey Graves and Gerald Massey. If you added up all the claims of Zeitgeist that were attributed to these two authors, you could account for almost every disputed claim that the movie makes, so it's important to briefly look at them. Kersey Graves, he died in 1883. He was an atheist, a spiritualist, that is, he contacted spirits, and he was a writer. His contribution was a book called The World's Sixteen Crucified Saviors. Despite his having no qualifications in anything to do with his claims, he simply tells us that there were 16 myths who had the exact same characteristics as Jesus. He makes claims like Krishna, the Indian deity, was born of a virgin. He says... Krishna had 12 disciples, was crucified, rose on the third day, and ascended into heaven. What's interesting is that even people that want to believe this theory recognize that you can't trust Kersey Graves. A good example of that is Richard Carrier. He's a historian, he's an atheist, and he's a person that believes in the Jesus myth theory. But he says this about Kersey Graves. He says, quote, The world's 16 crucified saviors, or Christianity before Christ, is unreliable, but no comprehensive critique exists. Most scholars immediately recognize many of his findings as unsupported and dismiss Graves as useless. After all, a scholar who rarely cites a source isn't useful to have as a reference, even if he is right. In general, even when the evidence is real, it often only appears many years after Christianity began, and thus might be evidence of diffusion in the other direction. Another typical problem is that Graves draws far too much from what often amounts to rather vague evidence. Carrier then goes on to list ten problems with Kersey Graves' work. I won't read them all here, but the first two say Graves often does not distinguish with his opinions and theories from what his sources and evidence actually state. Number two, Graves often omits important sources and evidence. And he goes on with eight more reasons why to disregard Graves. Another person that disregards Graves is a guy named Brian Fleming, who was the director of The God Who Wasn't There in 2005. He cautioned against using Graves as a source due to his lack of scholarship and unreliability of his claims. Graves' work has influenced the Christ Conspiracy and the Sons of God by Acharya S., who was the source for Zeitgeist. He's also used as a source for the Da Vinci Code, which kind of gives you an idea of how accurate the Da Vinci Code is. 
when Graves does make citations, it's often to Anacalypsis, which was a book by a guy named Godfrey Higgins, who died in 1833. And his book is full of claims that either are undocumented or come from sources whose credibility is completely unknown in this time. And that is from J.P. Holding. Even the author Godfrey Higgins' editor admits that Higgins was criticized by scholars who, quote, felt that amateurs had no place in their special fields. So even in his own day, Higgins was obviously considered unreliable by his peers. He makes claims like, quote, Jesus was black and went to Italy, which is why we see black infant Christs in Italy? For you conspiracy theorists like me, you're going to find it interesting that Higgins was a Freemason and a chosen chief druid, which, by the way, is the same title we're going to find given to Gerald Massey, the other zeitgeist source that we're going to look at next. Another connection to theosophy is through Higgins and Helena Blavatsky. Helena Blavatsky cited both Chosen Chief Druid Higgins and Chosen Chief Druid Gerald Massey in her works, which became the foundation of the New Age movement. So let's look at the other Chosen Chief Druid, Gerald Massey. Gerald Massey, born 1828, was an English poet and a self-educated Egyptologist, and he was born in England. I found it really interesting while doing this research that, just like Kersey Graves, Massey was also very interested in spiritualism, that is, speaking with disembodied spirits. And they both wrote books about it, but Massey wrote quite a lot about it. Here's a few quotes from Massey about his contact with spirits. He says, quote, My own hand impelled to write messages without any volition of mine. He's talking here about the New Age practice of automatic writing, that is when a spirit takes over your body and begins to write messages with your hand. Another quote, this is him speaking of himself in the third person. He writes, He had frequently, in pursuing the work, been referred by the spirit to books thoroughly unknown to the medium or himself, and on searching up the volumes had found therein the corroborating proof promised. So here he's saying that whenever he had a question, the spirits would tell him where the book is, and he goes and looks up that book, and sure enough, there's the answer to his questions. And it actually starts to make sense in the next quote why he starts to believe that these spirits have all the answers and shouldn't be questioned. His next quote says, Herefore, there is never ceasing need for revelation and manifestation of spirit world and a revelation for all, which gives an anchorage of fact to trust to. So he's so trusting of these spirits and what they tell him that he literally thinks you can anchor the facts to whatever they say. Anybody that's done a little bit of research into channeled material or material that comes from automatic writing or whatever finds that it all has this characteristic. You know, it's really scientific sounding. It sounds like, wow, you can really trust this. But then 10, 50, 100 years down the road, you find that that channeled material, while it sounded really scientific at the time, has now been completely discredited. So much of what the New Age believes today is based on completely discredited channeled information that sounded really scientific at the time. An example would be the photon belt. Just ask David Icke. The spirits told him to tell everybody a bunch of stuff that never came to pass. Uh, he now explains that away as, well, they were just trying to get me to grow and all this other stuff. But, And actually, Massey did the same thing. You can read about this. And his wife, uh, it was a really sad story. She appears to be extremely possessed by some spirits. And it's a very awful situation. They almost had to put her in a madhouse and all this stuff. Um, and then he also tells stories about how the spirits would tell him to write letters to all the newspapers to do certain things. He tells a story about this particular guy that was on death row. The spirits told him to write all these letters and he's mad at the newspapers because only one newspaper published it. And so the guy got killed anyway. And the spirits tell him, oh, Gerald, you did a good job anyway. Don't worry. I mean, this is amazing that this guy was really, really given over to doing whatever these spirits told him to do. This is all going somewhere. As we progress, you're going to see how influential Massey was in the zeitgeist version of history and all that stuff. So, actually, let's move on to his information. He's a guy that claimed to have a lot of understanding about Egyptian writings, even though he had no formal training in the area. And he discovered that Horus had all the same characteristics as Jesus, some listed here. They were born of virgins on December 25th. They both taught in a temple at the age of 12. They were teachers who had 12 disciples, were baptized in a river, gave a sermon on the mount, healed the sick, 
raise the dead, die by crucifixion, was resurrected three days later. It's almost an exact match of the zeitgeist claims from the movie. Today, contemporary Egyptologists totally discredit these claims, claiming that there is no mention of these facts in the life of Horus, which they should apparently know by now. W. Ward Gass conducted a worldwide poll of leading Egyptologists, including Professor Kenneth Kitchen of the University of Liverpool, Ron Lepron, Professor of Egyptology at Toronto. Lots of credentials there, but basically this this poll was to verify if there was any academic support for these claims. These scholars were unanimous in their dismissing these claimed parallels. One scholar, who called it, quote, fringe nonsense, also cautioned that, quote, Egyptology has the unenviable distinction of being one of those disciplines almost anyone can lay claim to, and the unfortunate distinction of being probably the one most beleaguered by the false prophets. Despite this, people still believe that Massey was like the only guy who got it right, and the reason no modern Egyptologists agree with him is because there is a conspiracy, when the real answer is that during Massey's day, the Rosetta Stone was only recently translated. Today, so much more is known about the Egyptian language. I mean, if you want to prove that theory, you have a tough time in regards to motives because they have to prove essentially that there is a conspiracy among all Egyptologists to disregard Gerald Massey as opposed to just Gerald Massey being wrong. They have to essentially say that either all Egyptologists are Christians and there's a big Christian cabal or that all Egyptologists are trying to defend Christianity at the very least, which is totally far from the case. If you want to talk motives, however... You don't have to read much of Massey's writings to find out how much he loathed Christianity. He called it a virus. And Christianity massively conflicted with his belief that the spirits he was in contact with were good spirits. And it would have also dramatically conflicted with his druid beliefs and practices. So you don't have to be a super genius or anything to postulate what might be happening here. Another guy that needs to be mentioned here is Edward Carpenter. He was a member of the Fabian Society, for all you conspiracy folks. He will also provide a link to Theosophy, which we will briefly touch on later. Of interest to us now is that he wrote a book on the Christ myth called Pagan and Christian Creeds. He was born 1844, was an English socialist poet, socialist philosopher, and anthologist, which basically means he was a collector of short stories and poems. He was also an early gay activist. In other words, he had no training whatsoever in the fields of anthropology, ancient religions, archaeology, or ancient languages. In fact, of his 32 works, Pagan and Christian Creeds was the only book of its kind. He mostly wrote on issues of art, gay activism, or social issues. I mention him here for a few reasons. One is because Acharya S., the main source for the Zeitgeist films, admits that her sources are mostly Massey and Carpenter, and it is my belief that that is where the Zeitgeist idea came from almost directly. His connection to Theosophy is interesting, particularly Annie Besant, and that may have been why Alice Bailey quotes him in her book Bethlehem to Calvary when she said, I cannot, of course, go at length into these different cults, but I may say roughly that all, or nearly all, the deities above mentioned, it was said and believed that they were born on or very near Christmas Day, they were born of a virgin mother, and in a cave or underground chamber, they were led a life of toil for mankind, blah, 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 just zeitgeist, word for word. Then Bailey concludes and says, these facts can be checked by anyone who cares to do so, and who is sufficiently interested to trace the growth of the doctrine of the world saviors in world idealism. So, just like Jordan Maxwell, they always say, go check my facts if you want, but notice that they never give you the facts up front. They say things like, I cannot, of course, go at length into these different cults, but I may say roughly that all, or nearly all... Anyway, so this Zeitgeist connection to Alice Bailey I think is pretty interesting, especially if you've been following the Zeitgeist debunking back and forth that's been going on. I actually sent this quote to Keith Thompson. He said he couldn't believe that we missed this when we were doing the initial research. So, so Gerald Massey, Kersey Graves, and Edward Carpenter influenced Blavatsky, Annie Besant, and Alice Bailey, who in turn influenced Theosophy, obviously, which heavily influenced the modern folks like Jordan Maxwell, Michael Tosari, and David Icke, and even the so-called zeitgeist consultant Acharya S. 
And Acharya S. or D.M. Murdoch is the last person I will mention in terms of this history as it relates to Zeitgeist. She wrote a few books promoting this theory. She also wrote the, quote, companion guide to Zeitgeist. She has many of the same problems as all the people she's drawing from. Lack of citations or dubious sources, etc. Even other mythicists seem to reject her work. There are plenty of atheist refutations of, his, of her work as well. And we are going to look specifically at her recent responses to many challenges when we get into this. Acharya S. will serve as a good segue between the idea of the Christ myth theory and astrotheology, because she believes them both. Astrotheology is not a really well-known theory, and was not widely believed before this new crop of New Age teachers like Jordan Maxwell, Michael Tassarian, etc., although they would, of course, reject the title of New Age teachers. In fact, the Zeitgeist movie begins with a monologue from Jordan Maxwell, and it's clear that Peter Joseph bought Maxwell's astrotheology concept, hook, line, and sinker. Astrotheology uses the Christ myth theory as a base, but it takes the root of saying that the Old and New Testament stories are simply myths that represent the movements of the stars and planets. This is a frame of the movie Zeitgeist, where they are claiming that the story of Jesus' birth and the star in the east are pointing to the rising sun. They say this happens on December 25th, so in essence they are saying that the idea of the sun rising on this day represents the birth of the sun. So many other claims like this are made. I'm going to quote here a few things from Jordan Maxwell's website about astrotheology. He says, As long as the sun comes up each day, life on earth will continue forever. Therefore, it is said in the ancient text that everlasting life was the gift that the Father gives through his Son. For, quote, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, S-U-N, that we may have life everlasting. On earth, not for you personally, but on earth everlasting life. Another quote says, Since evil and harm lurked at every turn in the fearful dark of night, all evil and harmful deeds were naturally the works of darkness. When, the return of the sun each morning, man felt more secure in his world and therefore was at peace, therefore God's sun, S-U-N, was with the warm rays of life and hope, the great prince of peace. And, of course, the reverse was equally true. The dark evil of night was ruled by none other than the prince of darkness, the evil slash devil. And this is just a small sampling of this kind of thing. One of the many reasons that astrotheology is not believed by many people is that it's not something you can get many scholars to agree with, especially language scholars. You can see that, for instance, the idea of evil and devil being related. I mean, it could be believed if you didn't think about it a whole lot. But if you looked up the word devil in an etymological dictionary where you find the roots of words, you're going to see that devil is derived from diabolos and that evil has a totally separate and distinct origin. The idea that they are actually related could never be argued by a language scholar, not to mention the idea of interchanging sun, S-U-N, and S-O-N, and pretending that it makes sense in any other language besides English or English-derived languages, is nonsense. There are so many problems with this idea of astrotheology, and I literally can't believe it has overtaken so many in the New Age. And we're going to look, as we get into debunking this a little later on, we're going to see some fundamental problems that I think you're going to really be able to use to explain this to people that believe this. I'm going to talk briefly, though, about the history of astrotheology as we believe it today. And the form that people now believe came to us mostly via 33rd degree Freemason, Manly P. Hall. And he had some interesting quotes like, When the Mason learns that the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands. He says that in his book, The Lost Keys of Freemasonry. Another quote is, It is so difficult to determine the positions of the ancient initiates. They are the invisible powers behind the thrones of earth. And men are but marionettes, dancing, while the invisible ones pull the strings. We see the dancer, but the ma mastermind does the work, remains concealed by the cloak of silence. He also says, The new Atlantis sets forth an ideal government of the earth. It foretells that day when, in the midst of men, there shall rise up a vast institution composed of the philosophic elect, an order of illumined men banded together for the purpose of investigating the laws of life and the mysteries of the universe. The age of boundaries is closing, and we are approaching a nobler era, when the nation shall be no more, and when the lines of 
race, and caste shall be wiped out, when the whole earth shall be under one order, one government, one administrative body. So back to astrotheology. Manly P. Hall taught it, and he did so a lot more eloquently than, say, Jordan Maxwell. And I have always thought that Jordan Maxwell was like a Manly P. Hall for dummies. Well, this past year, I finally figured out why they seem to have so many of the same theories. In a recent video put out by Maxwell entitled, Jordan Maxwell Research Team Appeal, Jordan Maxwell says that Manly P. Hall, upon his death, gave Jordan all Manley's personal notebooks and any other materials that constituted Manley P. Hall's personal library. Previously, Maxwell had made mention that he knew Hall personally. He said things like he was just such a wonderful man and he was his best friend and all these kinds of things. And it would appear that Hall was trying to make Maxwell something of a protege. I mean, if upon his death he willed his personal library to Maxwell. Maxwell is supposed to be the guy that exposes Freemasonry, but he actually talks quite highly of it in many places, which some people find to be shocking. For example, there's a video on YouTube called Sons of God, Jordan Maxwell, Sons of God, in which he talks basically the same kind of language that Manly P. Hall uses earlier about the New Atlantis and a loomed band of men that have a divine right to rule and all this stuff. I mean, when I first heard that, I had a, you know, open mouth, like, oh my goodness, he's really just laying this out there. Anyway, so moving on to Zeitgeist, let's take a look into some of these issues and let's see if we can find any information that will perhaps better arm us to show our friends and family and detractors the errors of the zeitgeist version of history. And we're going to do this in three parts. Number one, did Jesus exist? Number two, were there copycats? And number three, astrotheology. So first, did Jesus exist? There are over 42 sources within 150 years of Jesus' death which mention his existence and record many events in his life. As with all Christ mythers, Zeitgeist must do something with the non-biblical evidence, the historians, the writers who mention Jesus. It is a very difficult thing to come up with logical arguments to discount all of those sources, and as a result, quote, no serious historians believe that Jesus didn't exist. Now, sure, you don't believe me when I say that, but when that's an exact quote from Bart Ehrman, the famous agnostic and author, again, no serious historians believe that Jesus didn't exist. It tends to mean a little bit more. Richard Dawkins also, although not a historian, is in any event a very famous atheist, and he too concedes that Jesus, quote, probably existed. Michael Grant is an atheist historian, and he wrote this, To sum up, modern critical methods fail to support the Christ myth theory. It has again and again been answered and annihilated by first-ring scholars in recent years. No serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus, or at any rate, very few. And they have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant, evidence to the contrary. This is what Zeitgeist the Movie says about it. Quote, Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists only of a few sentences at best, and only refer to Christus, or the Christ, which, in fact, is not a name, but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. And that's all. That's all the time that Zeitgeist spends on debunking these historical sources. They don't go into any detail, they simply give these four reasons as to why we should discount the evidence. Number one, there are only four historians. Number two, only a few sentences. Number three, referred to only Christus or the Christ, which is in fact not a name but a title. It means the anointed one. And number four, Josephus has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Let's take the first one. There are only four historians. They word this really carefully because they know that there are many sources that show that Jesus existed, but only four of those sources are officially historians. This is actually an extremely high number of historians, and one has to wonder how many historians are needed in order for modern people to believe somebody existed. Is the magic number five? If it was the case that we needed more than four or four, we would not be able to confirm the existence of literally almost any figure in history. Four is a lot, especially considering the quality of those historians. Another reason that Zeitgeist gives is a similar thing. They say that 
there are only a few sentences devoted to Christ in these writings. So let's take a look at Tacitus. Tacitus was a first century Roman historian who lived through the reigns of over half a dozen Roman emperors. He was considered one of the greatest historians of ancient Rome. And he said this, Christus, the founder of the Christian name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also. Now, these may be a few sentences, but I'd say he did a good job as a quality historian to record the important points of Jesus' life from his perspective. He tells us, number one, that Jesus did exist. Number two, that Jesus was the founder of Christianity, so we know we're talking about the right guy. Jesus was put to death by Pilate. Christianity originated in Judea with Jesus, and later it spread to Rome. This also deals with the other point that Zeitgeist makes, which is that they only refer to Christus, which is not a title, but a name. And that's a really flimsy argument, because Tacitus makes sure that we know that he's talking about the founder of the Christian sect, who was put to death by Pilate in Judea, and that it spread to Rome. Tacitus simply referred to Jesus as it would have seemed right for him to record. All these people called Christians, you know, get their name from the founder called Christ, which, whether or not he knew that it was a title in Hebrew, is irrelevant. If he was speaking of another guy who was named Christ, who was put to death by Pontius Pilate, who was the founder of a religion named Christianity in Judea that spread in large numbers to Rome, then it would be a pretty big coincidence if he was talking about another guy. The only real hope for them is that it was a forgery, or that he was quoting Christian sources. And for both of those claims, I'll quote the divineevidence.com, a really good apologetics website, especially on this topic. She says, Could Tacitus have taken his information from Christian sources? Because of his position as a professional historian and not as a commentator, it is more likely that Tacitus referenced government records over Christian testimony. It is possible that Tacitus received some of his information from his friend and fellow secular historian Pliny the Younger, Yet, if Tacitus referenced some of Pliny's sources, it would have been out of his character to have done so without critical investigation. An example of Tacitus criticizing testimony given to him even from his dear friend Pliny is found in Annals 55. Tacitus distinguishes between confirmed and hearsay accounts almost 70 times in this history. If he felt this account of Jesus was only a rumor or folklore, he would have issued his usual disclaimer that this account was unverified. Well, what about the idea that this passage could have been a Christian forgery? Judging by the critical undertones of this passage, it is highly unlikely. Tacitus refers to Christianity as a superstition and an insuppressible mischief. Furthermore, there is not a surviving copy of Tacitus's annals that does not contain this passage. And so there is no verifiable evidence whatsoever of tampering of any kind in this passage. Then Zeitgeist mentions Suetonius and Pliny the Younger as the other historians that mention Jesus. They again use the idea that it's only a few sentences. This idea that there are only a few sentences is usually to imply that there was some kind of forgery by Christians. But none of these passages are even candidates for possible forgeries. The argument is not advanced by even the sternest critics of these particular passages. Then Zeitgeist makes this bold claim about Josephus. They say that he has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. It's very important to understand the details of why they are claiming this. Now, Josephus was a guy that we should expect to hear from regarding Jesus, considering Josephus was a first century Pharisee and historian of both the priestly and royal ancestry. And he provided important insight into first century Judaism, and because he was only three years removed from the time of Jesus. He would have been a very credible witness and in a great place to do his investigations and collect historical data about the issue. For example, there are totally undisputed passages in Josephus to John the Baptist, Pontius Pilate, etc. The truth is, is that there is really only a small section of this writing about Jesus from Josephus that is disputed. And what I'm going to do is quote the passage in question, and I'm going to highlight in red the contested portions of this passage. At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon their loyalty to him. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. 
Accordingly, they believed that he was the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. So that may be a few sentences, but it's a really solid historical account, and it really does sum it up nicely. The problem is, is those two disclaimers in red, which appear in the Greek and Arabic versions of the Josephus manuscripts, but do not appear in the other translations. In other words, some manuscripts do not contain the words, they reported that, as in, they reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion. Accordingly, they believed also doesn't appear in the other manuscripts, so it simply says, he was the Messiah, as opposed to, they believed he was the Messiah. Josephus was not a Christian, so it would be very doubtful that he would not give the usual and necessary disclaimers like they reported that and they believed that, as it appears in the Greek and Arabic versions. Therefore, if there was forging, it was probably by erasing those disclaimers as opposed to adding words. So again, if there was forging, the existence of Jesus was not the focus of that forging. The focus was on him being the Messiah and on his resurrection. But even if you decided to throw this whole passage away, there's still a big problem for Zeitgeist regarding Josephus. There's a second passage given to us by Josephus, and it is not surrounded by as much controversy. In Antiquities, Josephus says, So Aeneas assembled a council of judges, and brought before it the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, whose name was James, together with some others, and having accused them as lawbreakers, he delivered them over to be stoned. It must be noted that no copy of Antiquities has ever surfaced without the above quote quoted just as it is. Interesting here is the so-called Christ statement rather than the Christ. This reference shows that Josephus was not condoning the belief but simply documenting it. So it lends evidence to the other passages proper reading as well. Also, this passage concerns the actions of the priest Aeneas. Jesus and James were not even the primary focus of this verse and this passage is cited in other early works as well. So even if we dismiss the disputed words of Josephus, we still see that he testifies to a number of things in the two passages we quoted. Jesus lived in the first century, so he existed. He performed wonderful works. Some believed him to be the Christ. He was a teacher. He had many followers. He was tried by Pilate. He was crucified. He was the founder of Christianity. And finally, James was the brother of Jesus. All this when Zeitgeist tells its listeners, Josephus has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Zeitgeist does not mention the other non-biblical references to Jesus. These references were primarily from his enemies. People that, as I have mentioned, would have loved to tell people that he was just a myth. And instead, it takes 1,700 years for people to start to claim this. One interesting note to put all this into perspective is Tiberius Caesar. He was the Roman emperor who reigned during Jesus' ministry. So, he was the most famous person alive in Jesus' time, from an earthly standpoint, that is. He has only 10 authors who mention his existence within 150 years of his life. These include Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Seneca, Particulus, Plutarch, Pliny the Elder, and a few others. And, by the way, Luke who is the Bible writer. But if you remove Luke, since he's a New Testament source, there are only nine non-Christian sources. This means that there are just as many non-Christian sources for Jesus' existence as there are for Tiberius Caesar's. And to compare the total number of sources between Jesus and Tiberius Caesar, it's 42 to 10 ratio. Therefore, there are over four times as many sources for Jesus' life and deeds than for Tiberius Caesar's. If one is going to doubt the existence of Jesus, one must completely reject the existence of Tiberius Caesar. In addition, I think the idea that Christians can't use the New Testament as evidence for the existence of Jesus is mostly kind of like Christians playing nice and sort of tying one arm behind their back to give the opposing side a fair fight, because Christ's existence is established clearly by the primary documents of the New Testament. Yes, skeptical writers would dismiss these, but to do so is irresponsible, since more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts in whole or part establish the body of the New Testament literature. All of the New Testament has been completed within 60 years or so of Jesus' death. Of those 27 books, no less than 10 were penned by personal companions of the Lord. These men claim to be reporting history which is unlike any mythical account such as the tales of Horus, etc. These were reporting places, names, minute historical details that are amazingly accurate. If they were inaccurate, 
surely it would have been noted by the skeptics of the day. But again, that argument seems to have eluded everyone. Let's consider the following quotes from Sir William Ramsey, one of the greatest archaeologists in history. In his life, he did extensive archaeological work in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. Entering into this work, he was an unbeliever who was thoroughly convinced that the book of Acts in the Bible was a complete product of the second century, a theory which was taught in the German schools of higher criticism during that time. As a matter of fact, one of his goals was to prove that the history given by Luke was inaccurate. However, his beliefs were drastically changed as his archaeological finds proved that the book of Acts was accurate to the minutest detail. As a result, Sir William Ramsey became a Christian. He writes, I may fairly claim to have entered on this investigation without prejudice in favor of the conclusion, which I shall now seek to justify to the reader. On the contrary, I began with a mind unfavorable to it. But more recently, I found myself brought into contact with the book of Acts as an authority for topography, antiquities, and the society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details the narrative showed marvelous truth. In fact, beginning with a fixed idea that the work was essentially a second century composition and never relying on its evidence as trustworthy for first century conditions, I gradually came to find a useful ally in some obscure and difficult investigations. Sir William Ramsey has a lot of quotes about Luke that are interesting to read, but I'll conclude with this one. He says, Luke is a historian of first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians. Zeitgeist very much relies on the general public's ignorance to any of the information I just gave. But this reliance of ignorance is absolutely crucial in their next set of claims, that is, of the copycat saviors. So, let's take a look. So let's start with Horace. Zeitgeist focused heavily on Horace, and they said the following things were true about him. Horace was born on December 25th. That one is blacked out on the screen there, but it's there. Born of a virgin, his birth was accompanied by a star in the east. Three kings followed to locate and adorn the newborn savior. At the age of 12, he was a prodigal teacher. At the age of 30, he was baptized and thus began his ministry. Horace had 12 disciples. He performed miracles such as healing the sick and walking on water. Horus was known by many gestual names, such as the Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God. After being betrayed by Typhoon, Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and thus resurrected. What I've decided to do in this presentation is to focus on Horus and to go into a lot of detail debunking the claims about him for a few reasons. Number one, there are a lot of debunkings out there already. Zeitgeist refuted Final Cut by Elliot Nash. Keith Thompson has a great film debunking Zeitgeist as well. Both of those I'll put in the show notes and I encourage you to check out. But what's happened after the movie came out in 2007? All these debunkings came out and essentially just showed that the Zeitgeist movie was not quoting actual sources. They were quoting sources that were very modern and that were biased and things like that. So what Zeitgeist did was they sort of had an Empire Strikes Back. Since that time in 2007, there's been a lot of information put out by the source for Zeitgeist, Acharya S. She put out the Zeitgeist Companion Guide and a few other materials that are essentially are trying to answer the debunkers. They're saying, okay, so yeah, what we said was untrue, but here's some new reasons why what we originally said was true. In fact, they completely took off the old sources for Zeitgeist as if saying, okay, yeah, all this is wrong, but let's put out a whole new set of reasons why Zeitgeist was true. They actually did literally take that off the internet. You can only find it on archive sources now. Nowadays, if you try to find the Zeitgeist sources, it links you directly to the new material. And the new material does the exact same thing as the old material. It just makes it a little more difficult, essentially buying them time. It looks good. The sources look like they're all there. But when you actually start looking up the sources, you find out that they're either completely irrelevant or they're discredited. Or, as you see in so many cases, they're actually, you know, German or French papers that she's referencing. And then you look them up, translate them, and you find out they're quoting post-Christian sources, just like the original claim before. So let's just jump in and I'll show you what I mean by all this. So let's look at the December 25th claim. Was Horace said to have been born on December 25th, like Zeitgeist said? No, nothing even close to this is found in the Egyptian writings. So after Zeitgeist came out and the Zeitgeist Challenge website and other debunkers called them on this, Acharya says in the Real Zeitgeist Challenge audio, an interview that she did with the producer of Zeitgeist, Peter Joseph, she admits that 
No, the Egyptians didn't say that Horus was born on December 25th like they claimed. But because of Horus being related to the sun in certain ways, and the sun rose every day, it could be said that Horus was born every single day, and in that sense only, he was born on December 25th. So in that sense, Horus was born on December 25th, April 3rd, July 22nd, August 21st, every day of the year. So if that's what Zeitgeist meant when they told 100 million people that Horus was born on December 25th, then that is incredibly deceptive. So the next claim is, was Horus born of a virgin? They also say that Isis was called Mary during this claim. Both of these are totally false. The birth of Horus was weird but it definitely involved sexual intercourse and semen, and there are even hieroglyphics showing this act. Later on, Zeitgeist claims that there is a word in the Luxor temple called hwn.t that could mean virgin. The problem is, is that the context totally refutes it, not to mention that that same word can mean a woman who has had lots of sex and lots of children. And I discussed that claim in a lot more detail in the video The Real Zeitgeist Challenge Debunked. But the main thing that I want you to realize here is that if one gets pregnant because of sexual intercourse and semen, no matter which way you look at it, it's simply not a virgin birth. The other part of this claim is that Isis was somehow named or called Mary. Where they're getting this idea is sort of a trick based on a title of certain Egyptian gods that meant beloved. So a common thing to do was take a god like Ra and add Mary Ra to it, so it would mean beloved Ra. And according to the Egyptian Hieroglyphic Dictionary, there are entries for Mary Ah, Mary Amen, Mary Amen Ra, Mary Amen Ra Neb, and those are just the A's. In other words, every god is called beloved at some time or another. So they're simply saying that her name was Mary, which no Egyptologist would agree with. And even if you interpreted this as a title or a name, it would necessitate you saying that the real name for every Egyptian god was Mary. And this makes Zeitgeist claim that Horus was born of a virgin named Mary, nothing but incredibly deceptive. We'll take the next two together. His birth was accompanied by a star in the east, and three kings followed to locate and adorn the newborn savior. To back up this claim, Acharya quotes Gerald Massey, who says the following, The star in the east that arose to announce the birth of the babe Jesus was Orion, which is therefore called the star of Horus. There was once the star of the three kings, for the three kings is still the name of three stars in Orion's belt. So if you look at that, even Massey isn't claiming what she's claiming in this quote. So instead of trying to back up the claim that the Egyptians thought that a star in the east announced the birth of Horus, which is completely untrue, they launch into an explanation about how the star in the east is Sirius. They say that on December 25th, Sirius lines up with the three stars in Orion's belt, which they call the three kings, and the stars which aligned with Sirius point to the place of the rising sun on that day. In other words, the birth of the sun. The first and most obvious problem with this is that these three kings would be following a star in the west to the birth of the sun if this model was true. Problem two. These stars are called the three kings now, but there's no reference to them being called the three kings in antiquity. It's just a word game to kind of bolster their case, not to mention that there is no mention of three wise men in the Bible. The number of the Magi is not known. Tradition has made them three because of the number of gifts given. Problem three. Sirius is always aligned with Orion's belt. To say this happens on December 25th, as Zeitgeist did, is simply deception. Problem four. This so-called alignment with the three stars and Sirius and the rising sun if you can call it that, because unlike this diagram, these three stars in Sirius are below the horizon when the sun rises on December 25th. But even if you were willing to concede that, which I'm not, this same non-event happens every day for months on end. To say that it happens only on December 25th is obviously deception. Problem five, this does nothing to actually explain what the star in the east actually did according to the biblical account. Here's what the Bible actually said about this mysterious event. It signified birth. The Magi knew that somebody had been born. It signified kingship. They knew that he would be a king. It had a connection to the Jewish nation. It led them to Jerusalem. It rose in the east like other stars. It appeared at a precise time. Herod did not know when it appeared. It endures over time. 
yet it was ahead of the Magi as they went south from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and then finally it stops over Bethlehem. Zeitgeist has obviously carefully picked the elements of this story that it wants you to know about and has eliminated those elements that don't agree with their story. I recently saw a documentary film by a guy named Rick Larson about the Star of Bethlehem and was really intrigued by his hypothesis. In fact, I would encourage you to check it out. I haven't looked at all the details for myself, but I am certainly supportive of the hypothesis. There are certain elements that I would disagree with, but they are not deal breakers to his overall thesis. So I would encourage you to check that out. But regardless of what you believe about the Star of Bethlehem, this view, the one that Zeitgeist proposes, is simply not possible. We'll take these next two together as well. That Horace was a teacher at the age of 12, and that at the age of 30 he was baptized and began his ministry. So, to deal with the fact that this is a complete lie, and the Egyptian texts say nothing of the sort about Horus, Acharya S. says the following in her book, The Christ Conspiracy. Quote, the sun at its zenith, or twelve noon, is in the house or heavenly temple of the Most High. Thus, he begins his father's work at the age of twelve. She's referring to the story where they left Jesus behind at the Pentecost feast and when they went back and got him, he was in the temple teaching, and it says that he was age, at the age of 12. So Achari S. is saying all that is allegory for the sun being at the top of the sky at 12 noon. So I'm going to quote J.P. Holding on this. He says, first of all, Hebrews reckon that what we call noon is the sixth hour of the day. Second, the sun hardly begins its work at noon. It begins its work at dawn. Third, related to that, noon isn't even the, quote, age 12 for the sun. At this point, the sun is around five to six hours old, depending on the time of the year. The next part of that is even worse. Remember, Zeitgeist said that Horus began his ministry at the age of 30, like Jesus did. And in the complete absence of any Egyptian writing saying that Horus began his ministry at the age of 30, she then says this. The sun enters into each sign of the zodiac at 30 degrees. Hence, the Son of God begins his ministry at the age of 30. KingDavid8.com says, This is just a similarity of the number 30. How does a degree equal a year? Does it take a year for the sun to move a single degree? Of course not. And again, all of this falls on its face if you realize the simple point that sun, S-U-N, and S-O-N only rhyme in English and English-derived languages. They certainly wouldn't be the same in Hebrew. And this is Acharya S.'s response to that. She says, The bottom line is that even if we do not accept the etymology, the fact will remain that the assertions that the sun, S-O-N, of God, and the sun, S-U-N, of God, represents a clever play on words which reflects reality within the world of mythology. Oh, I see. It's just a clever play on words that reflects reality. And I guess that depends on if you believe her version of reality or not. So you'll see this pattern in the Zeitgeist Companion Guide material. It's like, ask to clarify, okay, where did the ancient Egyptians say this again? And the answer is, well, they didn't. But, you know, that's the, that's the pattern. Well, no, what I said isn't true, but let me tell you another story. The next one about performing miracles such as healing the sick, walking on water, Horus didn't do either of those things. Often what's claimed by people like Jordan Maxwell is that the sun shines on the water and it reflects on the water. So it could be said in that sense that Horus walked on the water. Kind of amazing that they make these claims to millions of people that the Egyptian story has Horus walking on water and then you find, oh, what you meant is that the sun shines on water? And keep in mind, I would accept that crazy idea if the Egyptians themselves had made some allusion to that. But it's obviously just a weak attempt to explain away their earlier lies. Okay, the next one. Horus had 12 disciples. Horus had four disciples, if you want to call them that. They were called Heru Shemsu. There's another reference to 16 followers and a group of followers called Mesuni, or blacksmiths, who joined Horus in battle but they're never numbered. There is no reference to 12 disciples whatsoever. So Acharya posts this picture from Tutmosis III's tomb in which Raharakti is seated and has 24 people in front of him. 
Acharya posted this one with only 12. Later on, a museum curator told them that the picture that she posted was cut off and there, there was actually 24 people there. And that's kind of a long, complicated thing. But in defense, it's said that, quote, we are not cherry-picking separate motifs here, as though we sifted through all the pictures of gods with various numbered groups until we just happened to find one that had exactly 12. And keep that in mind as we go through this, because the last quote from them is going to say that that's exactly all that they need to do, is find, quote, some close affiliation with the number 12. But anyway, the defense itself is problematic because that tomb, the Tutmosis III tomb, is totally filled with different numbers of people in front of Raharakti. You can essentially say, if that's how you say that he's got disciples, you don't need them saying Horus had this number of disciples. All you need to do is find a number and associate it with him. Then you could do that any way you wanted to with Tutmosis III's tomb, as you can see from the pictures here. But anyway, here's the quote on them about this point. And they're going to mention the curator here, who was the one that pointed out that Acharya had posted a cutoff picture of the Twelve. Anyway, it says, I think the curator and this zeitgeist antagonist are getting too hung up on the word disciple. It doesn't need to be a disciple. It just needs to be a close affiliation with the number 12 in order to be a conspicuous source of influence. So, they should have probably mentioned that when they told everybody that Horus had 12 disciples. So the next claim is, was Horus called by any of these titles? The Truth, the Light, God's Anointed Son, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God. Originally, no sources were provided here, but after the movie came out, she put out a companion guide and her new book where she attempts to find sources for these claims. Some of these titles are pretty close. You can actually make a pretty good case for the light, and I suppose that that is to be expected considering Horus's relationship to the sun. Although they did misquote the Bible in Zeitgeist when they said the way, the truth, and the light, when in fact it is life. Nevertheless, Jesus is also referred to as the light, so I would give them that one. But God's anointed son, or the Lamb of God, are just total long shots. And she says, for example, that God's anointed son is not a title per se, as she said that it was. It's a combination of two ideas in totally separate places. So, she attempts to find a place where he is called a son, and that shouldn't be any trouble because he is the son of Osiris, etc. And then she tries to find a place where he is called anointed, which is not so easy. And since there is no place where Horus is given the title anointed, she instead goes to the next best thing, which is to find a place where he is anointed. So, she quotes a section in the pyramid texts which talk about an ointment on Horus's head. But even in the very quote that she's mentioning, the ointment is being taken from his head and put on Eunice. Not to mention that it becomes clear that in the pyramid text, everyone is getting anointed. For instance, a bit earlier it says, quote, ointment for Horus, ointment for Seth. And that throws a bit of a monkey wrench into their basic premise that being anointed is declaring the same kind of thing that the title anointed would mean in the Bible. I mean, if Seth is getting anointed too in the same instance, obviously it's not meaning the same thing. Not to mention there is no parallel there, even if that's what she meant. Jesus never had oil put on his head like they did the Old Testament kings. He was simply called the Mashiach, the Anointed One. So again, what Zeitgeist said is that Horus was known by the Egyptians as God's Anointed Son, end quote. And instead, what we find that they meant is that he was a son in one place and in another place... He had oil put on his head. That's like me saying that Bill Clinton was known by all Americans by the title The Father of McDonald's. Because in one place you can find that he was the father of Chelsea Clinton, and in another place you could see that he went to McDonald's. These two facts don't let me tell you that he was known by all Americans as the father of McDonald's. Well, without being deceptive, that is, which is of course what Zeitgeist is doing. To explain how Horus was called the Lamb of God, she quotes Gerald Massey, who says this. Regarding the Lamb of God epithet, Massey explains, In the text, Horus is addressed as sheep, son of a sheep, lamb, son of a lamb, and invoked in this character as the protector and savior of souls, Horus is the Lamb of God, the Father. Now the problem here is that when you finally figure out where Massey is quoting from, you find that the mention of sheep here has nothing to do with Horus. It's a ritual performed on the dead about the afterlife. It appears that Massey's interpretation is that these sheep have something to do with Horus. 
Massey also cuts off the verse when it starts talking about sucking milk from its mother, which would be detrimental, and instead adds these lines. And invoked in this character as the protector and savior of souls, Horus is the Lamb of God the Father. I mean, maybe the spirits told him to do that, but it appears that Massey starts out with the conclusion of trying to find, say, the Lamb of God, and goes looking for a lamb, and then tells everybody that it has something to do with Horus. It's just completely deceptive. The next is the idea that Horus was crucified, buried for three days, and resurrected. So there are three claims here, none of which were said of Horus in the Egyptian records. Let's take the idea of crucifixion. This would be very difficult to prove since that form of execution, crucifixion, did not exist at that time. So how did they get around, number one, there not being any account of Horus crucified in the Egyptian records, and number two, no record of crucifixions in general exist in ancient Egypt? Acharya S. explains it this way. The crucifixion of Horus is misunderstood because many erroneously assume that the term denotes a direct resemblance to the crucifixion narrative of Jesus Christ. Hence, it is critical to point out that we are dealing with metaphors here, not history, as the crucifixions of both Horus and Jesus are improvable events historically. So, if I may offer an interpretation of what she said, she says, yes, I know I told 100 million people that Horus was crucified but don't look around for any proof of that. She then appeals to the fact that Horace wasn't a real historical person, as if that would matter at all in relationship to this question. The thing everybody asks Acharya to do all the time is to show sources for her claims about Egyptian beliefs. And that has nothing to do with the realness of Horus. The question is, did the Egyptians claim in their writings anywhere that he was crucified? It's like if I stood up and told you that the Egyptians wrote that Horus was a 40-foot-tall gorilla, and you rightly asked, um, where did they say that? And I said, uh, duh, Horus wasn't a real person. I get to claim whatever I want to about it. It is a really lame argument, to say the least, and she uses the same argumentation in various ways in her companion guide. So, now that she has established that she can provide anything that she wants as proof that Horus was said to be crucified, she says the following... The issue at hand is not a man being thrown to the ground and nailed to a cross, as Jesus is depicted to have been, but the portrayal of gods and goddesses in cruciform, whereby the divine figure appears with arms outstretched in a symbolic context. She also shows this picture on the screen, and she quotes an Egyptologist who says the following, Horus shows himself in the image of the hawk whose wings span the sky. Now remember again what Zeitgeist claimed. Horus was crucified, buried, and three days later resurrected. 100 million people believe that Horus was crucified to death and raised three days later, and this is what they meant by that? She has a few other equally ridiculous arguments, such as this idea of a Jed pillar, which I cover in the Real Zeitgeist Challenge debunked video. Now, in regard to Horus's rising after three days, she also has to get pretty tricky. She cites another author who cites another author, and when you track that one down, you find that, number one, they're quoting from Plutarch, who is not only post-Christian, but even known by Plutarch scholars to deliberately deceive in this area of supposed parallels. It also doesn't help that he is a priest of Delphi, which is the mystery religion Greek form of Horus. So you could say that that was a bit of a bias as well. But nevertheless, when we track down this specific reference, we are taken to a German book by R. Reichenstein called Die Hellenischen Mystery Religion. And in English, that means the Hellenistic Mystery Religion. So already we know that whatever this guy Reichenstein says is not speaking of what the Egyptians believed, but rather what the Greek mystery religions believed about Horus many, many hundreds of years later, and in fact, after the time of Christ. And this particular method of Acharya S. comes into play so much with debunking Zeitgeist. So many of the claims that Zeitgeist makes are about gods like Mithra and Attis and all these gods that originally had pre-Christian forms. But the Roman mystery religions revived these old stories because Rome was kind of a melting pot where everybody came from the various cultures. They took their, their stories to Rome, and Rome would give them new characteristics. And this was often after the time of Christ. So the new characteristics obviously were influenced by Christianity. 
So as if we didn't need any more reason to dismiss this idea that this comes from a post-Christian mystery religion instead of actual Egyptians' writings about Horus, we find even more reason to dismiss it because her source, Reichenstein, is a scholar who is known to be wrong on the very issue that he is being used for here. The Yale University Library website says of him, Bussat, then Reichenstein, along with Bultmann, were notable for promoting theories of pre-Christian Gnosticism and the influence of Gnosticism on the New Testament. Modern scholars now reject these theories while acknowledging that many of the features of later Christian Gnosticism can be drawn from pre-Christian Jewish and Hellenistic roots. In other words, Gnosticism borrowed from Christianity, not the other way around. And many elements of Gnosticism were borrowed from Judaism, which has many of the same themes and elements as Christianity, obviously. I thought I'd briefly mention this other thing that people provide for proof of the three-day resurrection, although I don't think I've seen Acharya S. use it. Um, it's the Ikernafret Stella, and it was translated by Richard H. Wilkinson, and the idea is that it's a five-day festival known as the Passion Plage, and it apparently implies a three-day death for Horus. But I've read this Stella, and it's very clear that Horus is very much alive and actually a big part of this festival. He is at different times avenging, fighting victoriously, and all during the time he's supposed to be in the tomb. As far as the resurrection, she again quotes not an Egyptian source, but another Greek historian like Plutarch to get this idea. She also, in a recent audio on this topic, appeals to a famous scholar on the resurrection named T.N.D. Mettinger to prove a point. I find this interesting to hear because Mettinger is definitely not saying what she is saying. This is a quote regarding the Christ theory, which comes from him on this subject. He says, In fact, most scholars have come to doubt whether, properly speaking, there really were any myths of dying and rising gods at all. In the Osiris myth, one of the best-known symbolic seasonal myths, Osiris does not really come back to life, but simply continues to exist in the nether realm of the departed. In a recent review of the evidence, T.N.D. Mettinger reports, From the 1930s, a consensus has developed to the effect that the dying and rising gods died but did not return or rise to life again. Those who still think differently are looked upon as residual members of an almost extinct species. He further states that those that believe in the Christ myth theory, as taught by Acharya S., are stuck in the scholarship of the 19th century. And as I mentioned, we don't have time to go through all the claims of all the gods here, but you can see various videos online at my website, zeitgeistchallenge.com, for more information about all this. So let's move on to astrotheology. Now, we've briefly discussed the three stars in Orion's belt thing, and that's just one example of astrotheology. Basically, it's the idea that the Old and New Testaments were written as symbolic allegory to explain stuff that happens in the stars. In that case, they say that the birth of Jesus story in the Bible is really just symbolic imagery of those three stars. Now, by far the most important claim of astrotheology is that the story of Jesus is symbolic of the age of Pisces. So, basically, this idea of the age concept is not just in zeitgeist or astrotheology, but it is fundamental in the New Age. If you've ever listened to any New Age speaker talk, then you've heard this idea that we're about to enter into a new age. Whether they call it the age of Aquarius or not is really irrelevant. So this is foundational. This is important. It, this not just debunks zeitgeist, if you can debunk it, but it does, debunks everything that New Age teachers say. They always say, we're going into the new age of Aquarius, and Jesus is tied to the age of Pisces, and they use that by saying that he fed people with two fish one time, which is only half true, because a week later he fed people with more than two fish, and they show this Pope hat thing, and they say, okay, well that means that Jesus was a fish, which of course, Jesus has nothing to do with the Catholic Church or anything, and all the stuff that they use is irrelevant. We already knew it was irrelevant. But finding out about this age concept will really help you break free from the entire concept of zeitgeist and the new age movement but first we have to describe what exactly is happening with this age concept basically you're looking at a backdrop of the constellations on your screen and that moves if you will in a circle very very slowly every 26,000 or so years based on the precession of the equinoxes which is just the wobble of the earth it basically changes what the stars look like on the horizon every 26,000 years. 
the age concept comes from the idea that it's significant that wherever the sun breaks free from the horizon of the earth or wherever the sunrise is on the equinox and whatever stars are behind the sun generally speaking at that time when it rises is whatever age that we're in now here's the interesting part that concept of wherever the sun rises and whatever stars are behind it is what age that we're in is a totally new concept the constellations themselves aren't new they've been around for a long time but that concept that that is significant where the sun rises and we'll call that the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius or whatever is an invention of modern 19th century astrology here's a quote from a guy named Noel Swerdlow he is a professor at the University of Chicago he has all kinds of credentials he writes books on Renaissance astrology he's very very qualified to talk about this and he was presented with this information of Acharya S and the Zeitgeist movie from a guy named Mike Lacona who is writing a refutation of Acharya's material so I'm going to read to you this quote from Dr. Swerdlow and then we're going to discuss Acharya's rebuttal to it it says in antiquity, constellations were just groups of stars. There were no borders separating the region from one from the region of another. Within which group of stars the vernal equinox was located was of no astrological significance at all. The modern ideas about the age of Pisces or the age of Aquarius are based upon the locations of the vernal equinox in the regions of the stars of those constellations, but the regions, the borders between those constellations, are completely modern conventions of the International Astronomical Union for the purpose of mapping, and never had any astrological significance. I hope this is helpful, although in truth, what this woman is claiming is so wacky that it is hardly worth answering. So when this woman says that the Christian fish was the symbol of the coming age of Pisces, she is saying something that no one would have thought in antiquity, because in which constellation of the fixed stars the vernal equinox was located was of no significance and is entirely an idea of modern, I believe, 20th century astrology. So in response to this, Acharya S. basically ignored the obvious intent of this. She instead provided evidence that ancient people knew about the zodiac, which wasn't what anybody was asking. The question is, did the ancient people think that the location of the equinox among one or another zodiacal constellation or the age concept as we see in the modern astrology movement exist? So in Mike Lacona's counter-rebuttal to Acharya S. on this point, he first points out that she didn't even address the question there about the age concept. And he also uses a source that she quotes, one Dr. Edwin Krupp, to support her idea that the ancient people knew about zodiacal constellations, which of course everybody would agree with. So Lacona uses her own source and contacts him about Swerdlow's point and asks him what he thinks about it. And this is what her source said. Professor Swerdlow is well informed on the ancient history of astronomy and astrology, and his report to you reflects current scholarly opinion formulated by textual evidence. Although people have traditionally projected terrestrial concerns and priorities onto the sky and celestial myth, the detailed astrological mapping your opponent advocates, speaking of Acharya S., is not supported by evidence, and certainly cannot be tracked back two millennia or more as described. So what he's saying is that these people that say the New Testament was just about the age of Pisces and trying to tell people about that is completely bogus. It's literally an impossibility that ancient peoples would have even thought of that. I honestly don't think that you can overemphasize this. This idea that the age concept is a modern construction is a major blow to New Ageism and occultism of all types. These people have simply been deceived. In my talk about the New Age and the Antichrist, I explain a clear motivation for this age concept and why it is so pushed on the public. So, in conclusion, we looked at the evidence of Jesus' existence, we looked if there were copycats in ancient history, and we finally looked at the concept of astrotheology. Zeitgeist is a modern delivery method for an old lie. And it causes a lot of people to ask questions, and it's good. Questions are good. Never run from questions. If what you believe is true, then there's nothing you need to fear. And if what you believe is not true, then you don't need to believe it in the first place. I would submit to everyone out there that the reason most of the zeitgeisters believe this is either because they 
just believed it outright because the claims are rather bold. Hitler said people would more readily believe a big lie than a small one, but also because it makes them feel like they can wash their hands of God and have no real accountability. It's a very tempting carrot to take. But of those people, there's always a few that would go wherever the evidence leads. And it's that kind of person, if you have them in your family or in your class or at work or online, then you simply have to help them. They are kind of the diamond in the rough. They're kind of rare. You know, don't simply tell people that it's false. Show them why it's false. Take the time to do this. Put together an email or a blog or a video or a PowerPoint for them. And you're going to learn a whole lot, and you're going to be prepared when it comes your way again, which I promise is going to be a lot more often. Thanks for your time.